Hi, this is the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. In this video, we're going to work through some exercises from one of my go-to textbooks in traditional logic, namely Peter Kreef's Socratic Logic. We're going to be working on some exercises, and these exercises deal with conditionals, and we'll be evaluating arguments, real-world arguments, so to speak, with meat in them. And I have some notes here. We're going to go through them. And first, I'm going to open the textbook up and look at the table of contents um, to show you that we're going to be dealing with chapter 13 here, and that's on compound syllogisms. So that's where we're going to get these exercises from. So if we flip through the, the textbook um, to the chapter, it talks about hypothetical conditional propositions, disjunctions, and conjunctions. That's not entirely relevant for our purposes. Um, but there is some symbolic notation that you'll find in any textbook when it comes to conditionals. He uses the horseshoe for the if-then connective. I don't like that. I'd rather just use the arrow. But that's commonly found in a lot of, uh, a lot of textbooks. But um, regardless, it is what it is. Um, but I want to get to the exercises and show you those. He also talks about reductio ad absurdum arguments here. Um, there's lots of examples, as you could imagine. And if we get into the exercises, these are the things we're going to be going through. We'll go through a few of them. And um, they're really interesting because he quotes from various philosophers. Um, he quotes from works of great literature, from religious texts and so forth. So you really analyze a lot of arguments in this book. And that's what makes it handy. It's not just some kind of abstract symbolic manipulation. So let's first briefly look at some notes. These are not from the textbook. These are my own notes, but I hope they're going to come in handy because I think that showing a bad or false proposition really illuminates what a conditional proposition is. So for example, if it's cloudy, then it's raining. Well, that's a bad or just a false proposition because there are two problems here. Okay, first is a confusion of sufficient and necessary conditions. And also, you can think of examples that falsify. Right now, it is cloudy out, but it's not raining, so that conditional is just false. Now, clouds are necessary for it to be raining, but it's not sufficient. Just having clouds does not mean there's going to be rain. So there's this distinction between sufficient and necessary conditions, which is very important to understand if we really want to understand a conditional. And again, we can falsify it. I look outside, it is cloudy, but it's not raining, so we have a counterexample. This is a false proposition, just a bad proposition. Okay, so we have to understand this distinction between sufficient and necessary conditions. So symbolically, we represent this as P arrow Q, so the arrow is the conditional, the if then, so if P, then Q. So P is called the antecedent, and Q is called the consequent. And when we're thinking about the sufficient necessary condition, note that the antecedent is sufficient for the consequent, and the consequent is necessary for the antecedent. Remember that, and then you will remember conditionals. And you'll also understand what makes a good inference or what makes a bad inference when it comes to arguments that contain these types of propositions. So there really are two um, types of good inferences with this. So we have what's called modus ponens, and then modus tollens. So with modus ponens, we have if P, then Q, P, therefore, Q. So P is sufficient for Q. So if P is indeed the case, Q will be the case. Then we have modus tollens, if P, then Q, not Q, therefore, not P. Q is necessary for P. So if Q is not the case, then P cannot be the case because Q is necessary. Q is necessary for P. So we have modus ponens and modus tollens. And those are the two good inferences when we're thinking about the logic of conditionals. So now we're going to jump into the exercises from the textbook from Peter Kreeft. And again, I think they're really interesting and good. So let's do this. So the first one is, so the first exercise argument, number one, there is no case known, neither is it indeed possible, in which a thing is found to be the efficient cause of itself. For in such a case, it would be prior to itself, which is impossible. This is a quote from St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologiae. So what you want to do 
is think about the argument and determine if it's valid or invalid. Pause the video if you have to. What is P? What is Q? Construct the argument and then determine the validity. So look at the form of the argument. So for example, we might say that P represents a thing is the efficient cause of itself, and that Q represents a thing prior to itself. And then we can think about, okay, what is the argument? Well, we really have if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. In other words, if a thing is the efficient cause of itself, then a thing is prior to itself, but a thing cannot be prior to itself, therefore a thing cannot be the efficient cause of itself. We have a modus tollens inference, and modus tollens is indeed valid. It's a valid structure or pattern of good argumentation. So we have a good, valid argument. Logic is a skill to spot arguments, to spot the forms of modus ponens and modus tollens in real day life, so to speak, in an argumentation. How about this, number eight? Total pacifism might be a good principle if everyone were to follow it, but not everyone does, so it isn't. This is from Gilbert Herman, The Nature of Morality. What do you think? What's P, what's Q, what's the argument? Is that form valid or invalid? Is it a good argument? Is it a bad argument? Pause the video, try it yourself. That's really important. So like before, just think about what is P, what is Q, just like the last example, and then think about that pattern. Is it good or is it bad? Okay, is it valid or invalid? Okay. So we might say that P represents something and Q represents something. So P, will say, represents everyone followed total pacifism. And that Q represents total pacifism is a good principle, okay? So we have the P, we have the Q, and we have this argument, if P, then Q, not P, therefore not Q. So in other words, if everyone followed total pacifism, then total pacifism is a good principle. But not everyone follows that principle of total pacifism. So therefore, total pacifism is not a good principle. Well, that's actually invalid. It's not a good argument because we have the fallacy of denying the antecedent. We're confusing sufficient and necessary conditions. It's treating the antecedent, everyone followed total pacifism, as necessary. But it's not necessary. It's only sufficient. So therefore, it's a bad argument. It might look good on the surface, but if you analyze it, it's invalid. So that is an invalid argument. And let's try... A few more problems here, um, and they're all from Peter Kreef's textbook. Let's try this one. So this will be number uh, 16. Let's see if I can kind of cover this up. Okay, I guess I'm okay. So number 16 is, whenever I eat chocolate, I get migraines. I got migraines today, so I must have eaten chocolates today. So like before, pause the video. What's P, what's Q? Construct that argument the pattern of that argument. And think about that pattern. So we can say that P is I eat chocolates. Q, we can say I get migraines. So we get the argument if P then Q, Q therefore P. But again, we have something that's invalid. We have the fallacy of affirming the consequent. So if I eat chocolates, then I get migraines. I'm getting migraines, therefore I eat chocolate? No. P, I eat chocolates, is sufficient but not necessary to get those migraines. So we have an invalid argument because we're confusing sufficient and necessary conditions. How about this? Number six. And this is from St. Augustine. There's a lot of good arguments and interesting arguments here. So this is a little bit more complicated, I suppose. So St. Augustine argued against the skeptic, if you are deceived, you must exist. But if you say you are deceived, therefore you can be certain you exist. But if you can be certain you exist, you can be certain of something. And if you can be certain of something, you are no longer a skeptic. All right, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. You have more than just P and Q. And also it's very reminiscent of a famous argument from Rene Descartes, which we have a series on this YouTube channel. So Descartes uses a kind of similar argument to Augustine. So we have more than just a P and a Q. We have a P, Q, R, S, and T. So label those up and determine if that argument is valid or invalid. So that's the goal here. So we can say the following. This is what the textbook does, actually. 
Um, so P is you are deceived, Q you exist, R you can be certain you exist, S you can be certain of something, T you are not a skeptic. Okay, so we really have a big, massive, so-called hypothetical syllogism. Um, and we can think of it really as a series of modus ponens inferences. That's also kind of possible here. So one way to construct this would be just to say if P, then Q, if Q, then R, if R, then S, if S, then T, P, so therefore T. Okay, so you go right down that entire chain to get that final conclusion. So it is a valid argument, and it's a pretty cool argument. Um, and you'll find others like that in this uh in this very book. So, so these are exercises from Socratic Logic by Peter Kreeft. It's one of my go-to recommendations. Down below you will see a link that you can click and you can purchase this textbook if you so desire. I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorites. Um, if you enjoy this type of content, let me know in the comments section below. I'm designing a new course that will come out sometime, hopefully uh, sooner rather than later. But I appreciate your viewership, and I hope you get something out of these videos. If you do, let me know. Thanks for watching. Good luck to you, and be well.